it's about uh, 20 minutes after the hour, uh, May 1st, 2015, the quorum is present. I want to welcome everybody to the conference committee. Uh, Madam Chair, look forward to having uh, upcoming discussions and meetings. And uh, for today, I thought it'd be good to have Mr. Lundeen and Ms. Roberts uh, run us through the change item spreadsheet, and then have Ms. Jaynes and Mr. Shepard uh, go through the language in the side-by-sides, which are before you. Uh, after that, if we can see if any members have any discussion. Uh, with that, I think we'll probably do to have a few introductions. Uh, I'll introduce myself and pass it on to the chair, and uh, we'll just go around the table. I'm uh, Tom Saxog. I'm chairman of state government finance and uh, military and veterans affairs in the Senate. Uh, I represent Senate District 5 which includes Grand Rapids, Bemidji, Walker, with the Leech Lake Indian Reservation and the Chippewa National Forest in the middle. Um, uh, I'm retired independent insurance agent for 36 years. Uh, I've been married for 44 years to Nancy, who shot an 82 yesterday. And I'm down Nine. here. Nine <laughs> Nine uh, huh? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, I have uh, two kids, two grandkids. My daughter's a teacher. My son's a professional musician. Uh, I look forward to the fruitful discussions that we'll have here to uh, resolve the differences in our two bills. Chairman? Uh, I'm Sarah Anderson. I am the House Chair of State Government Finance. Um, I uh, represent the area of Plymouth, which is a western suburb of the Minneapolis area, and I am married to a school teacher who teaches physics and calculus and chemistry and all those good things. I have one son who is a first grader, and um, yeah, be interested to hear the music that your son maybe can give to us at some point. Uh, Adam Seidel, Republican CA for State Government Finance. Members, I'm Brian Cook, GOP Caucus Research for State Government <laughs> Finance and Veterans Affairs. I'm Helen Roberts from the House Fiscal Staff. <clears throat> Mark Shepard from the House Research Department. I'm Representative Bob Lunen, uh, handling the Shakopee area, and I sit on the Gov Finance Committee. I'm also on the Commerce Committee and the uh, Jobs and Energy and Development Committee as well. Uh, married with uh, four adult children, one of which, uh, my third one is just finishing up his last year law school and has actually been able to do a little bit of lobbying around and um, is fascinated with the place. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion and the, the conversations and learning. I'm Carolyn Lane. I represent uh, Columbia Heights, St. Anthony, and New Brighton. Um, this is my fifth term. Um, I have five kids spread across the country. One with two of the grandkids are in Columbia Heights. The others are California, Massachusetts, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. My youngest daughter is graduating from law school in D.C. And thank goodness she has a job that's going to pay off those loans. <laughs> uh, Representative Tim O'Driscoll represents the uh, central Minnesota area, Sartell, Sac Rapids, uh, St. Stephen, Holding Fort, and townships in between. Um, on different committees and commissions with a number of senators and members of the House here. So I'm looking forward to our conference committee. Jim Geldman, DFL Caucus Research. Amy Strini, Senate Republican Research. Um, Ryan Majerus, Senate Majority Research. Mitch Bergeron, Committee Administrator for Senator Saxon. Uh -huh. Lexi Spangl, Senate Council. Stephanie James, Senate Council. Kevin Lundeen, Senate Fiscal Analyst. Melissa Wickland and I uh, represent District 50, which is Bloomington and Richfield, and I'm also on I'm on state and local uh, government policy committee, and as well as health and human services policy, and education E12 finance and policy. Um, have two kids. Um, I, I'm married to an engineer, and I was an uh, electrical engineer for a while in my career. Um, and my kids are, one lives in Washington, D.C., teaching uh, preschoolers, and I have a son who's in his second year at UMD. So, <coughs> glad to be here. Hi, I'm Senator Jim Carlson. Uh, I represent District 51, which is most of Egan and uh, about a third of Burnsville. 
And uh, I'm on, of course, on the State Department's and uh, government uh, finance uh, in what is a veterans also committee. And I'm the vice chair, and I'm also the chair of the Veterans Finance Committee. I'm a retired 3M engineer. Uh, I have a retired uh, a wife that's retired German teacher, 2004 German teacher of the year in Minnesota, and uh, a daughter who is an attorney in Los Angeles. Uh, she's uh, with a she's a partner on the uh, in the company of uh, Alston Bird, and a son who is a computer engineer and he works for Facebook. So uh, I uh, I've lost all of my Minnesota children connections here. They moved <coughs> to a higher tax state, but. Uh, <laughs> And so I'm looking forward to uh, working on this on this budget to uh, make uh, the state of Minnesota better. Is that all? That's all. Okay. One more. I, oh. I'm sitting next to Senator I'm, Jim uh, Metzen. Senator Jim Metzen. <laughs> I chair the Commerce Committee in the Minnesota Senate. I'm on the Rules Committee. I live in South St. Paul. Represent South St. Paul, West St. Paul, Mendota, Mendota Heights, Inver Grove Heights. That's it. I'm happy to be here. All right, I'm um, Senator Sandy Pappas. I'm Senate President. I'm also chair of two rules subcommittees, that? Budget and Personnel and Ethics. Uh, and I'm vice chair of the Pensions Commission with uh, Representative O'Driscoll. I see there's a number of pension commission members here on the conference committee, which is great. Um, I represent inner city neighborhoods in St. Paul. I live downtown. I walk to work, weather permitting. Um, I have been married to my husband for 38 years, so I've got a ways to go. Um, I'll never I, catch up. I'll never catch up. <laughs> I, well, I'll tell you, no one will ever catch up with me and my grandchildren. I have three daughters and 18 grandchildren all living in Israel. And if you beg me, I'll show you pictures. <laughs> so looking forward to the conference committee. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think at this point we'll have uh, Mr. Lundin and Ms. Roberts run through that uh, spreadsheet. Uh, we can... We can run this any way we want, but I, I thought probably most of the questions should point to clarification on, uh, on both the spreadsheet and the uh, side-by-sides. Uh, we want to get any other major discussions. I, I thought we'd probably wait till after, but with that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, however you're going to do it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Roberts and I will just, I'll kind of run through some of the Senate provisions and she'll run through the house and we'll kind of go back and forth as we cover the various agencies. Um, the spreadsheet that we're taking a look at is the change items spreadsheet. It's not the bigger detailed one but the shorter one that you should have in your packets. Um, starting out at the top of the spreadsheet, the first is the uh, change items for the legislature and the Senate has included uh, statutory appropriations for the Senate office building rental payments in the amount of 12.9. Um, the Senate also in, uh, included an increase to their budget of 3% and uh, didn't make any changes to the House budget. The Senate left it at the base level. Um, we did include, or the bill does include a rider about the House vacating the chamber for the capital renovation and um, some costs if this doesn't take place. Uh, and then moving down uh, for the Office of Legislative Auditor, uh, the Senate bill does include half of the increase that the OLA came forward with. And the Senate bill also includes a 1.8% increase to the OLA and to the rest of the LCC's operating budget. Uh, moving on down, uh, the Senate did not include anything for the administrative rule system request uh, through the revisor's office, and the Senate did include um, half of the request for the IT services and staff that came from the revisor's office. And lastly, the Senate did include uh, 35000 a year for this biennium for the Data Practices Commission to provide a, a part of a staffing. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Roberts. Um, members, for the House position on the legislative funding, you will see um, on line seven, there's a 5% reduction to the Senate operating budget. There's also a 5% reduction to the House operating budget. 
And um, on line 11, there's a 5% reduction to the overall LCC operating budget. In addition to those reductions, there is um, increased funding provided on line nine for the Office of the Legislative Auditor. This includes uh, their staff funding request and also some funding for the fiscal note function that is um, the oversight function being moved to the, that office in this <coughs> bill. Um, funding is provided uh, beginning in fiscal year 17 for the um, revisor's office administrative rules system and then also fund their requested funding for IT services and staff. And there's um, on line 14, you'll see there's a reduction of 196,000. This is for elimination of the Legislative Water Commission. Questions? All right, go on. Um, and I'll continue on. So those are the changes in the House bill for the operating budgets for the legislature. Um, it, you'll see below that there are, is a a group called legislative carry forward cancellations. Those are one time cancellations from the carry forward accounts that each the House, the Senate and the LCC have. And then finally for the legislature, you'll see there's $2 million that is a transfer from the state employee insurance group reserves to a rulemaking impact fund. Okay, taking a look next on line 27 for the governor's office. Uh, the Senate bill does include the increases that the governor requested, the 1.8%, and then some additional staff uh, to deal with legal emergency preparedness and constituent work. And the House uh, bill has a reduction for the governor's office of 6.5% from the base. And you'll also see on line 32 under the special revenue fund that there is um, a cap on the amount that the governor's office is able to charge agency for personnel costs within that office. Uh, next on line 35 is the state auditor. Um, the Senate bill does include uh, the full requests that the auditor had and the governor included for the staff retention and then also the technology staffing. Uh, the Senate did provide 35000 a year for the local government infrastructure stress study. Um, this was a, originally a higher request and um, we heard some testimony from the auditor um, requesting uh, 35000 which would pay for um, some software related to the mapping. And, and apparently the auditor was going to be leveraging some support with the U of M and some foundations for the remainder of the funding. For the House position on the state auditor, you'll see on line 39, there's a base reduction of approximately 6.5%. Um, I'll also note that there is... Um, on line 41, you'll see noted the county audits um, being permitted to be done by CPAs, that's House File 495, and the impact from this is tracked in the tails, both on the expenditure and revenue side. Uh, moving down next to the Attorney General, uh, the Senate um, included the uh, base budget there with no changes. And the House has a base reduction of 6.5% or $2.9 million. Uh, and then with the Secretary of State, uh, the Senate included the uh, base uh, appropriation there with no changes. There is uh, one bill that both the House and Senate have um, that was uh, tracking some costs. It was dealing with some changes related to fees. Um, and there were some small IT costs in there that are paid out of a statutory um, appropriated fund. Uh, technology funds, so that takes care of the small uh, programming costs. And the House bill has a reduction for the Secretary of State of 6.5%. Uh, next is the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. The Senate bill includes the 1.8% compensation adjustment, and both the House and Senate include <coughs> the website redevelopment cancellation and appropriation. This is, if you recall, is where um, we canceled the fiscal year 15 appropriation because the office didn't feel they were going to be able to spend it before the end of the biennium and then reappropriated it in fiscal year 16. Um, and the House position on the Campaign Finance Board is a base reduction of $107,000 <coughs> per year. And uh, also on line 57, you'll see the elimination of the public subsidy program. So those are the general fund savings from el eliminating that program. Um, turning to the next page of the spreadsheet, um, administrative hearings at the top. 
Um, the Senate included the 1.8 percent compensation adjustment and also included the requests uh, related to the data practices <laughs> hearing costs and the campaign violations hearing costs. <coughs> and the House bill includes the funding for the data practices hearing costs and campaign violations hearing costs. It does not have the 1.8 percent operating adjustment. And then on line 65 for minute services, uh, the Senate bill includes the compensation 1.8 percent adjustment. And the House bill is at base funding for minute services. And I should point out both bills do um, include the cash flow for the IT consolidation. It's um, very similar to what we did two years ago. Uh, moving down next on line 73 for the Department of Administration. Um, the Senate bill included the 1.8 percent operating adjustment. Uh, the Senate bill also included funding for the equity and public contracting related to the veterans, minority, and women. Uh, there was nothing included for the SMART expansion. Uh, the targeted group business disparity study, the Senate included the funding that was requested there. The Senate also included funding um, to help agencies uh, with the uh, Olmstead plan and that funding is in there one time as requested. Uh, line 80, the Senate also included a reduction to the in lieu of rent, it was a, a million dollar reduction starting in fiscal year 17 and later when we get to the language you'll see that we are requesting the Department of Administration to do an evaluation of this appropriation um, in light of all the capital renovations and relocations that are taking place. Uh, the next item is local government data practices training. Uh, there's one time uh, funding for the biennium in the amount of 200000 uh, the Senate bill also includes the state agency's accommodation reimbursement um, proposal and includes 500000 a year in general fund dollars that will be transferred into the special revenue account. And then moving down to public broadcasting, uh, the Senate um, includes a number of increases over the base. For the public TV grants, it's 300 a year one time. For the public TV uh, matching grants, it's just the base funding. Uh, for the NPR equipment grants, it's 250 a year over the base uh, one time. Uh, for the AMPERS community service grants, it's 200,000 a year one time over the base. And then the AMPERS radio equipment grants is 50,000 over the base. And the AMPERS emergency equipment grants is also one time 200,000 a year over the base. And the House bill for the Department of Administration going back to line 75, you'll see it includes um, some funding for the equity and public contracting. Uh, this is for IT support only. Um, and then on line 79, there's a base reduction of $3 million for the biennium. And I should note, I just realized that um, the House bill does actually allocate this reduction through the programs of Department of Administration. So there is a reduction to the in lieu of rent. and. I can adjust the spreadsheet so that those are shown on the same line. Um, and um, for the state agency's accommodation reimbursement, the, House, the Senate has this in a general fund appropriation, but the House um, has this from a special revenue fund from contributions from the agencies, and that's on line 91. Um, and then you will also see that the House bill contains reductions to the various public broadcasting grants um, 100,000 for the public TV equipment grants, 778,000 for the matching grants, um, 206,000 for NPR equipment grants, and then uh, 210 for the Amherst Community Service grants, and 34,000 for the equipment grants. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Is the, House, is the House position, is that from ongoing money, I assume? That's um, from the base, ongoing money. Or, um, are you are you asking about the NPR or the I'm public broadcasting? About all of those um, public broadcasting, where the Senate um, has additional money, it's one-time money, and the House is reducing it. I assume they're reducing it from some kind of base fund. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, yes, that's correct. 
Okay, the next item on line 93 is the cap board and the Senate included the 1.8% operating adjustment. And the house bill has a base reduction of $10,000 per year. Uh, the next item for Minnesota management and budget, uh, the Senate bill included the 1.8% compensation adjustment. Uh, the Senate bill also included um, three, $3 million for the biennium to maintain the enterprise systems. This is related to the uh, SWIFT accounting system, the budget system, fiscal notes. Um, and the Senate also included um, half of the requested funding to enhance enterprise level services. Um, this was a request to um, provide some uniform guidance to agencies on things such as vets preference, secession planning, accessibility, and so forth. The House bill has a reduction to Minnesota management and budget of 8.5% to their base. And then you'll also see the return on investment funding of 156,000 per year for House file 795. Uh, I should point out um, the Senate does have the return on investment. It just wasn't in this bill. It's in the Health and Human Services bill. So this is one of the jurisdictional issues that will have, will have to be sorted out by leadership where that's going to fall. Um, and then moving down to the Department of Revenue, uh, the Senate bill includes the 1.8% compensation adjustment. Uh, the Senate bill includes $4 million for the biennium for maintaining and enhancing uh, the, the tax system. And the House bill for Department of Revenue has a $1.8 million reduction. And then moving to uh, page three of the spreadsheet, uh, at the top is the Gambling Control Board. Um, there was a uh, decrease in the base appropriation that the Senate picked up. This was because of the current revenues uh, were not supporting the base that was being carried forward. And, and then there were some other changes going on that uh, uh, freed up some more money in the, in the governor's bill and or actually I guess I'm getting myself confused here um, no that the governor's bill was increasing the regulatory fee on charities and the Senate bill did not pick that up rather on line 120 we put in general fund dollars uh, to make up that difference and for the house um, position on the gambling control board you're not seeing any change items here because the appropriation from the special revenue fund is at the base level I believe that was a holding position as discussions continued on the various proposals related to that board. Uh, the next is the uh, Racing Commission. There was a request for some one-time general fund money that the Senate did include, 341000 for the biennium. And then there were also some changes related to the Class C licenses that would uh, bring in some additional revenue. And so that, uh, that additional revenue of 182000 is showing up here. And the House bill does have the additional operating revenues from the Class C license changes, but does not include the general fund operating increase. Uh, the next item is the Amateur Sports Commission. Um, the Senate did uh, include the operating budget increase that was requested of 34000 a year. And the Senate also included a uh, $4 million one-time appropriation uh, to deal with the Mighty Ducks indoor air quality improvements uh, for public ice facilities. And the House bill for the Amateur yeah. Sports Commission has a reduction of $13,000 per year. And then moving down to the uh, Black Minnesotans Council, uh, the Senate did include the uh, compensation 1.8%. And um, the House bill, and maybe I should just cover all the councils or explain what's going on with the councils on the House side. Um, for fiscal year 16 and 17 only, the funding for the four councils is moved from the general fund to the special revenue fund, and you'll see on page R31 of the side-by-side, -side, there is a, a new fund set up that is funded through contributions from the uh, State Employee Insurance Fund, a one-time transfer from the, um, an appropriation in fiscal year 15 for the PEEP fund. 
and then um, additionally, there's 871,000 that would remain in the state campaign fund. And since the public subsidy program is abolished, that money would not be needed. And um, so the, those transfers are created at this new fund and the appropriations for fiscal year 16 and 17 only are made from that fund. In the tails for 18 and 19, the funding would, would go back to the general fund. Chair, would you, would you uh, think, uh, would you explain that a little bit? Uh, maybe I'm the only one that doesn't understand it, but the, the transfer of the appropriation from the new ethic councils fund, what, what is that? Uh, um, Mr. Chair and Senator Metzen, um, you'll see there's language in the bill that creates an ethnic council's account in the special revenue fund. And that account is funded from three sources, a $2.2 million transfer from the CGIP insurance reserves, um, 871,000 from the remaining funds in the state campaign fund, and then 294,000 from a fiscal year 15 appropriation for um, the PEEP program. And those amounts are all trans transferred and deposited into this new account and then the appropriations for the councils are made out of that account for fiscal year 16 and 17 only and the appropriations are made at the base level for all of the councils <coughs> oh. all right, all right. <clears throat> excuse me if you take it away from some somewhere else i will talk about that later I, yeah. it's got to be hurting <coughs> in some other areas if you take the money from a the pension was it a pension part of it 2.8 or something or what was it no you're a, you're a, you're right but you're, you're also right let's discuss that a little bit later yeah okay yeah. Oh, we won't get too far into the weeds this no, afternoon. No. Yeah. all right okay um <clears throat> moving on then uh to the minnesota historical society um, the first, the Senate included the 1.8% compensation adjustment and then also included some additional dollars. Um, the Historical Society did have a request for additional dollars and a portion of that was funded one time in the salaries and programs area. A uh, million dollars uh, for the biennium was, is being appropriated for the digital preservation and access. And then also 500,000 for the biennium for the uh, history education. Uh, moving down, the Minnesota Military Museum Archivist is uh, funded at 100,000 one time. And the Farm America, who was asking for uh, some additional dollars for some capital improvements, is funded one time at 200,000. And the House bill for the Historical Society, beginning on line 160, there's 1.5 million for the digital preservation and access, 150,000 for the history education, and then um, the House and Senate actually have the same position on the military uh, military museum of 100,000 one time increase, hmm. and then the House bill has a $75,000 one time increase for Farm America. And then I think at the bottom of the spreadsheet on line 169 is the Minnesota Arts Board. Uh, the Senate did include the 1.8% compensation adjustment. And other than that, I, I, the House just provided the base funding there. Uh, moving to the next page of the spreadsheet is the Humanities Center. Um, the Senate included the general operating support increase of 99. Sorry. Helen, do you have something to add? Um, Mr. Chair and um, members, sorry, I did miss one item on the um, Historical Society on the House side on line 167. There's a one-time limit on the Historical Preservations Grants funding. This is an open and statutory appropriation, and there's language in the bill um, eliminating that funding just in fiscal year 16. Sorry about that. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll pick up with the Minnesota Humanities Center as I had mentioned uh, the general operating support increases included. Um, I, I should point out um, on these other items that the House has included in this bill. The Senate has included uh, two of them in other bills. The grant to the Minnesota Council on Economic Education uh, is in the Senate E-12 bill, and the healthy eating is included in the Health and Human Services bill in the Senate. 
And then the additional funding that the, the house position has and in, in addition to those items already mentioned is 250,000 one time for the everyone wins reading program. Uh, next is the accountancy board. Uh, the Senate included the 1.8% compensation adjustment and also included 10,000 one time uh, related to the notification to licensees of the proposed statutory changes in the bill. And the house position also included that $10,000 um, change related to the, the licensees. Um, I should also note just for the rest of the occupational boards, the house position is at base level funding. And uh, the Senate uh, did provide the 1.8% to the architectural and engineering board, as well as to the cosmetology examiners board. Um, the Senate bill also did uh, pick up language that dealt with some licensing and fee modifications uh, and has appropriated $1.2 million a year to the uh, cosmetology board for that. Uh, that money is essentially going uh, to pay for an additional 13 inspectors. And I've also listed here the mobile salon regulations. Um, the fiscal note that we got with that had a, a cost of it, of a part of an inspector, but we were told by the cosmetology board if, if, we, if they got the additional 13 inspectors, we would not have to um, track a cost for that. But there is some revenue when this becomes effective in the next biennium that will show up at the end of the spreadsheet. Uh, the next is the Barber Examiner's Board, which has the 1.8% uh, compensation adjustment. And then the next is the Human Rights Department, which I, I should point out is another uh, jurisdictional issue. The Senate does not have that in the state government area. So that is something that needs to be uh, sorted out. And the House bill does ha include funding for the Human Rights Department with um, two changes. There's approximately 6% base reduction. And then there is also $80,000 per year designated for the St. Cloud office. Um, the next item is a House only change provision. Uh, the House reduces the contingent account base, re base by $250,000 per year. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Senator Pappas. Is the contingent account part of the Human Rights Department? Or whose, whose contingent account is that? Um, Mr. Chair and Senator, the contingent account is an account that is uh, managed by Minnesota Management and Budget, and it's for unanticipated um, emergencies or expenses that agencies, um, you know, that come up after the, the budget is passed, and they um, will go through the LAC process to access that funding. Uh, the next item on the spreadsheet is the uh, dealing with the appropriation to the Public Employees Retirement Association. Um, this is related to some of the action that was done in the pension bill relating the MRF uh, account being merged into PARA. And the Senate made a reduction. The, the base appropriation was $24 million a year. Uh, the Senate reduced that by $8 million a year. Um, and the House bill reduces that, the state portion of the aid, by $18 million per year for four fiscal years, 16 and 17 only. And then it um, would remain at current levels in the tail, tails. <coughs> Uh, the next item on the spreadsheet is the Department of Military Affairs, and the department had proposed uh, doing some reallocation. There was a, um, a carry-forward uh, funds that had built up in the enlistment incentive space, and so they requested or uh, reallocation of those dollars into their maintenance training facilities and to, and to their general support area. And you can see that taking place. Um, the other item that was included by the Senate is $1.5 million a year uh, for a local government public safety leave reimbursement grant. <coughs> and then moving down the spreadsheet, uh, the department also did request a one-time transfer from enlistment incentives um, to take care of maintenance of training facilities. So that is included uh, in the Senate bill. Um, and members, I should note that the um, change item spreadsheet 
for the house is an error. We do not include the $10 million transfer, um, internal transfer for the enlistment incentives, but there is a one-time cancellation on line 220 of $1.1 million from the enlistment incentives um, carry forward account, and that is used, you'll see language in the bill that it's in support of the military museum um, increase and also the Vets Affairs increase. Uh, the next item on the spreadsheet is dealing with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, the Senate bill includes the 1.8% compensation adjustment to the program and services area of the department, and then also includes the 5% compensation um, adjustment to the uh, veterans health care homes area of the budget. Um, the Senate bill also includes the million dollar request for the repairs and betterment uh, related to the veterans home. And we also include language in the bill uh, that increases the appropriation uh, for the cost of care calculation, personal needs allowance, and that's increasing by 88,016 and 110,000 <coughs> in fiscal year 17. So it's basically adjusting the, uh, currently it's uh, $90 per month and it's increasing that up to 122 in fiscal year 16 and 130 in fiscal year 17 and then having an annual adjustment after that. And the, the last item there is the military Mr. Lundeen, the, uh, Chairman Anderson has a question. Uh, Mr. Lundeen, so the last week we received a uh, request from the governor's office for the veterans um, as an additional item. That's not included in your bill either then, is that correct? That's correct. And, and the last item that the uh, Senate included for the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs um, is related to uh, an appropriation and some legislation that was in the supplemental bill dealing with the military and expedited temporary licensing and uh, the, the Board of Teaching um, was not able, did not feel they were going to be able to expend the dollars that were given to them, the 44000 for the rulemaking related to this. So we took and canceled the dollars um, in fiscal year 17 and then reappropriated them to the Department of Veterans Affairs for transfer to the Education Department. The House bill for the Department of Veterans Affairs includes the $1 million from the general fund for the repair and betterment request. And then also on line um, 233, you'll see that the House does also fund the original $6.1 million request related to veterans health care operating increases. Um, in this case, the House is funded again from the special revenue fund from a transfer from the CGIP reserves into the Department of Veterans Affairs Special Revenue Fund. If we turn the page of the spreadsheet, we can uh, run through some of the revenues and transfers in the bill that um, may offset some of the appropriations we went through. Um, the first uh, under the legislature is um, the Legislative Office Building Parking Revenue Reimbursement. Um, this offsets the general appropriation because the general appropriation that the Senate included um, does include the debt service for the, uh, the uh, parking ramp. Um, the next item is uh, with the Secretary of State with the uh, changes to the business services fees. There was a slight reduction in revenue to the general fund. And then also under the cosmetology board, this is showing up the fee revenue. Um, as you may recall, the, the fees are deposited as a non-dedicated um, receipt in the general fund, so they need to be um, reappropriated or need to be appropriated to the um, cosmetology board if they're going to have access to them. And then also the mobile salon regulations. If you look out in the tails, there is um, 14,000 in revenue, and that's because this particular provision is not effective until fiscal year 18. Um, and for the House, on the general fund revenue uh, changes, you'll see 
the three thousand dollar per year loss in revenue from the business services fees and filing identical to the senate and then also um, on line 259 a transfer and cancellation in fiscal year 15 of the, the peep appropriation uh, the next item then is dealing with some non-general fund revenues and transfers um, the ones the Senate includes would be related to the the license changes, Class C license changes to the Racing Commission. And the House bill includes that those changes related to the the licensing for license changes for the Racing Commission. And then above that, again, you'll see um, the transfers from that I had gone through before to the Ethnic Councils Fund from the Campaign Finance Fund, uh, the PEEP funding, uh, and, and the CGIP transfers are outlined in this portion of the spreadsheet. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Papp. Ms. Roberts, would you just explain to us again what is the source of funding for PEEP and CGIP, what those programs are? Um, Mr. Chair and Senators, um, the, the PEEP funding was a appropriation made in fiscal year 15 of $294,000 to Minnesota, Minnesota Management and Budget for a health care transparency um, provision um, and that in the bill the that appropriation is canceled in fiscal year 15 and transferred to the special revenue fund it hasn't uh, been spent yet as far as we know mr chair yes chair anderson uh, uh thank you mr chair and uh senator pappas uh we did our bill was it just last week <laughs> it seems so long ago when we did the bill and as of april 22nd uh, that money had not been spent we received notice today that mmb has backdated the expenditure of that money um, to back in 2014 even though last week when we checked that money had not been spent so i think that's a, a better question for mmb and i'm i'm just curious you know how often MMB backdates expenditures. I think that'd be a good conversation to have at some point, but not today. And then, uh, and Senator Pabst, CGIP? Yeah. Um, Go Ms. ahead. Mr. Chair, members, the transfers Roberts. from CGIP are from the State Employee Insurance Fund reserves. Uh, those are the reserves. The State Employee Insurance Plan is a self funded plan, and they maintain a certain level of reserves. Currently, the reserve is <coughs> higher than what the, the target set by the um, actuaries uh, would be. So there is a transfer from that, that fund. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm just trying to yes, understand Senator this. So Pappas. the House is borrowing from the CGEP reserves, or is that a permanent? It's taking the money permanently <coughs> from the reserves, but then the ongoing <coughs> council goes back to the general fund? Chair Anderson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Pappas. Uh, what we did is we mimicked what uh, Senator Ranum and Senator Cohen had done in years past. They did this in 2003 and in 2007. There is a surplus currently in the CGUP fund, and we're taking a portion of that surplus dollars and uh, reallocating it here in this bill. Thank you. Onward. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the next is just uh, showing the cancellations on line 278 that we talked about related to the Campaign Finance Board uh, regarding the, for the House, the PEEP funding, and then uh, for the Education Department appropriation. And then moving to the last uh, page of the spreadsheet, it just it gives the total um, general fund expenditures. And I should point out again that the Senate numbers and the governor's numbers don't include the Human Rights Department. So you have to take that in account when you're looking at the differences um, in the bills. And unless Ms. Roberts has something else to add, I think we are done with the spreadsheet. Good. Thank you. Is there any general questions that we can answer I'm sure we'll be talking this uh, spreadsheet over uh, for many hours so I just right. have one more question yes uh, Senator Pappas thank you um, Mr. Chairman and either Ms. I guess Mr. Lundeen the last three lines of the bill of the spreadsheet bills track separately the elections omnibus bill LCC Secretary of State could you just kind of talk about that a little bit Okay, this, this is a, a bill in the Senate of Senator Siebens that is sitting in the Finance Committee. 
And these are some of the these are some of the costs in there. The ninety nine thousand they were actually counted against the Senate target, so that's why I was showing them on the spreadsheet. Then they're accounted for in that way. So the assumption is that they are if they pass, they're negotiated in this bill. No, th this is being treated as a separate, separate bill. bill yeah. Separate appropriation. Yep. Separate bill. Separate appropriation. All right. Other questions, Mr. Chair? Yes. Senator Carls. I have a question on, uh, and it actually is uh, on line 177 on page uh, 4, which is the, the number that, uh, it's the bottom line on the Human Humanities Center. Uh, you said that line 174 and 175 are in two different bills. Uh, 174 is in E12 and 175 is in HHS. Are they in there at the same amount as what, what they otherwise would be shown here? And is I think you you mentioned that they're in there, and I'm wondering if the difference uh, in the column uh, that shows the over under is really a uh, million dollars, or if it's a million two fifty. Mr. Lundy, they they are not included in this spreadsheet. I I don't recall the exact uh, level of the appropriation. I don't know if Ms. Roberts does. I I'm thinking they're probably less than what the House has in, but. We were just making note of that as an as an item that leadership had to sort out. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, Miss James. And uh, Mr. Shepard. Mr. Chair, the first provisions, we'll, uh, we'll Mark and I, Mr. Shepard and I will begin um, on page R31 with Article 2, and um, Mr. Shepard will describe the House provisions. Um, Mr. Chair, member section 1 on the House side relates to uh, legislative and congressional districting after the next census, and it states the principle that the legislature won't delegate its duty to draw districts to a commission or a council, and then it lists the principles that will be applied in the next districting, and that continues over to page R33. Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Everybody understands that that uh, Article One was what we just went over, so we're on yeah. Article Two now. Okay. All right. I might not have picked that. Up. All right. You know, that's one thing I understood. Good. Way to go. I thought I'd tell you that, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, uh, the next provision is on page R33 on the Senate side. Uh, this provision permits the Legislative Coordinating Commission to appoint staff for the Legislative Commission on Data Practices. And also on that page, Mr. Chair, on R33, there are uh, two provisions that relate to the Legislative Auditor. Uh, the first one in the House side, Section 2, uh, relates to material that is also on page R35 and R36, and this is a House proposal relating to the role of the legislative auditor in the preparation and review of fiscal notes and revenue estimates. So the House uh, has, a, has a provision under which the legislative auditor would review the work of executive branch agencies, would be able to accept the analysis or disagree with it, and would then pass that on to the legislature for consideration. There's a separate proposal uh, that starts on the bottom of page R33, which was a separate bill, House File 1694, um, Senate File 1596, which uh, has the auditor involved in evaluation of economic development incentive programs, uh, each, each biennium. Uh, on page R34 on the Senate side is the standing appropriation for yeah. um, the, the Senate, to the Senate, to pay the principal and interest components of the rental payment that they, that the Senate will pay on the lease purchase agreement with, um, between the Department of Admin and the Department of Management and Budget. Um, so paragraph, the first paragraph, um, subdivision one is for the is for the, for that for the principal and interest components. Subdivision two is a standing appropriation for operate operations and maintenance payments, also for the new Senate office building. And I apologize, I have a cold and I uh, <coughs> get a terrible. So I apologize. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> yes, Senator it could be because of the air quality in the Capitol, <laughs> the construction zone. <coughs> a lot of people are sick. D. 
take your take your time, Ms. James. We'll be fine. <coughs> oh, Mr. Chair, the next provision on the <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. James, you done. Father, me. On, on the House side, on R35 and R36 and R37 is the material I spoke of a minute ago about the role of the legislative auditor in fiscal notes, revenue estimates, and on page R37, um, local impact notes. Um, the next uh, House provision at the bottom of R37, the very last line, and continuing on to R38, uh, relates to audits of counties. And, and probably the, um, the key uh, provision there is in the middle of page R38, subdivision three on the House side, um, a county audit, or uh, subdivision two on the House side, excuse me, a county must have an annual financial audit and may choose to have the audit performed by the auditor or may choose to have it performed by a CPA firm. And, and the rest of this section explains the procedures if a county chooses to have a CPA firm do that work. Chairman, uh, <coughs> yes, Senator Metz. <coughs> uh, don't they have to have an audit now? How's that work? I think it will. We'll, 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 we'll have Chair Anderson explain that. So the more people could do work. There are different CPAs and others can do the work. <coughs> Mr. Chair. Yes, Senator Anderson. Uh, Senator Metzen, uh, the Chairman, issue. Chairman Anderson, excuse me. <laughs> it's okay. I, we, we're kind of informal in the House. <laughs> It's all good. Um, Senator Metzen, on uh, this issue, what it is is there's a group of county auditors. Um, uh, currently, they are audited by the state auditor, and there are counties that would like to have uh, audit firms do it instead of the state auditor because there would be a cost savings for them. And so this just gives them that flexibility to be able to do that. Thank you for this. I'd like to see that. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair and members, on R39 on the House side, Section 7 relates to the uh, telephone bills that elected officials receive. Under current law, you, as you know, you all have to sign your monthly long-distance phone bill. This uh, provision would say that the signature requirement does not apply to a month in which the person's bill is less than $5. The person would still have to pay the bill. All the information would still be public. <coughs> but it would eliminate the signature requirement. Mr. Chair, the next set of sections on the House side on R39, R40, and R41 all relate to uh, the same issue. It, the House bill repeals the, the state elections campaign fund and the public subsidy program. That, that's the policy change. And these sections all make conforming changes to that, um, as do um, at the end of this article, there's a number of repealers that uh, relate to that issue as well. And, and that, in this part of the bill, continues on uh, to page um, R43 uh, uh, in the middle of the page, uh, where the House uh, bill moves. There's a, another issue here. Uh, sections uh, on the House page R43, sections 14 to 23 on the House side which uh, continue over to page R50, all relate to a rulemaking issue. This is from House File 1261. Um, the key parts are that if a rule has a substantial economic impact as defined on page R43, then there, there would be a peer review panel that would be set up by the legislative auditor. As Ms. Roberts uh, mentioned earlier, the House provides some money for funding that. And the rule then would not take effect until approved by law. Um, other uh, key parts, I would say, uh, there are some additional notices to be given, uh, primarily to legislative officials. And then on page R49, uh, there are amendments in uh, the provisions governing challenges in court to rules. Uh, and, and this. Um, provision says that if a person is challenging uh, whether an agency has uh, adopting a policy guideline or bulletin without following the proper rulemaking criteria, the uh, agency can't, if someone challenges that in the Court of Appeals, the agency has to cease enforcing that until the matter is resolved. Now, Mr. Chair, the next House section is 
on page R50. Um, this is from, uh, it continues on to uh, page R53. It's a bill of, that Representative Lane was the chief author of, House, House File 1353. And uh, this uh, reformulates uh, the councils. It creates a new council on Latino affairs, council, Minnesota African Heritage Council, Council on Asian <coughs> Pacific Minnesotans. It provides for the membership the appointments, terms, and removal uh, provides for the Legislative Coordinating Commission on the top of page R52 to appoint an executive director for each council. On R52 specifies duties of the council, and on R53 duties of council members and provides for reporting. <clears throat> and in the repealer section of this article, the current laws governing these councils are repealed. Uh, Mr. Chair, the next provision on the House side at the bottom of page R53 uh, requires the uh, Commissioner of Management and Budget to maintain a centralized uh, tracking list of new agency projects that cost more than $100,000 that are paid for from the general fund. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, on R54, uh, the House and the Senate have provisions that appear to be identical relating to uh, prepayment for information technology hosting services. And on R55, at the top of the page, uh, requires the Commissioner of Management and Budget to report to the legislature within 14 days of a, a budget forecast on uncertainty in uh, the general fund revenue projections. <coughs> the next uh, two items on page R55 on the House side relate to the legislative auditor's evaluation of uh, economic incentives that uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, the next provision on page R55 and the top of R56 um, appear to be identical House and Senate provisions relating to agencies uh, limiting the ability to propose fees or fines of more than 10 percent in a, in a biennium. Mr. Shepard, are uh, section 26 in, uh, of the House and section 3 of the Senate the same? Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe that they are, are, yes. uh, are they or at least similar? Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Go ahead. And, and, and Mr. Chair, I believe that uh, section on the bottom of R55, section four on the Senate side, section 30 on the House side, I believe are also identical. On R56, the House has a provision requiring the Commissioner of Administration to provide rehearsal and storage space in a building in the Capitol to the state band. On the bottom of page R56 and the top of R57 is a House provision requiring notice to legislative budget chairs of changes and anticipated cost of changes in state construction and remodeling projects. The bottom of page R57 relates to the SMART program and requires the Commissioner of Administration to provide services under the program to small agencies requesting those services. <laughs> Mr. Chair, on page R58, section 5 on the Senate side and section 34 on the House side are um, similar. They um, relate to an accommodation reimbursement account that agencies can uh, apply to have the expenses that they that they make to p provide reasonable accommodations to employees be reimbursed. Um, the um, Senate side um, provides a uh, general fund appropriation that we, Mr. Lundin would have highlighted in the spreadsheet. The House has a different method of funding that. And uh, Mr. Chair, as as uh, Ms. James indicated, the House method is that the Commissioner of Management and Budget would determine the amount of money to de be deposited in the account each year and would require agencies to make <coughs> deposits in the account, or if that was problematic for certain funds, they would maintain their own separate accounts. Mr. Chair, on page yeah. R59, at the very bottom, section 6, and going on to the next page, R60, um, section 7, uh, these two provisions are um, changes to the MMB's grant-making um, statutes to remove general obligation grants from application under this <coughs> section. Um, 
And then um, Section 7 um, exempts both general obligation grants and capital project grants to political subdivisions. And I'll do also Section 8 on the, on the Senate side um, before Mr. Shepard describes changes to the, sim to the same statute from the House side. Um, Section 8 eliminates a requirement that the commissioner of MMB give prior authorization for a grant recipient of general obligation bond proceeds to incur expenses. And uh, Mr. Chair, on the House side of R60, the House provides that the, the laws governing the Office of Grant Management and state grants uh, do apply. It strikes the language saying that that authority does not apply to capital project grants to political subdivisions so that it would apply. Uh, Section 36 on page R60 on the House side requires the Office of Grant Management to monitor grants made by the Department of Commerce. Um, at the bottom of page R60, also dealing with grants, the House bill specifies conditions under which grants must be terminated. And on R61, uh, the House has a section providing that an agency cannot charge a recipient of a general fund grant a fee and may not deduct money from the grant to pay administrative expenses incurred by the agency administering the grant. The last section on the House side of R61 also relates to the Commissioner of Administration. It, uh, the current law authorizes the Commissioner to delegate duties to the head of another agency or to a subordinate. And uh, this bill requires that at least once every three years the Commissioner would audit use of that authority and would also develop guidelines for agencies to protect state legal interests. Mr. Chair, on page R61, Section 9 on the Senate side makes changes to the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program. Um, it expands the type of project financing that be, may be used to pay for a Guaranteed Energy Savings Program and um, also eliminates the specification that utility cost-saving measures become the sole property of the state after a final obligated payment. It also changes certain calculations about the threshold that determines whether the commissioner is authorized to enter into an agreement for a utility cost savings measure. And finally, it eliminates a restriction that, the, that precludes the implementation costs of the utility cost saving measure from exceeding the amount to be saved in utility and operation and maintenance costs. And that takes us to um, page R64, section 10. Uh, on the Senate side, this sets the size standards for small businesses in, um, that applies for preferences in state contracting. It sets it to be the same as is defined in federal rules. And on the House side of that same page, uh, Mr. Chair, relates to certification of veteran-owned businesses for state small business uh, procurement programs. And it says that uh, before the commissioner certifies that a business is majority owned and operated by a veteran, uh, the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs must verify that the owner is a veteran. And at the bottom of page R64, um, section 11 on the Senate side and going on to page R65 is a requirement that organizations that administer contracts for state funded capital improvement projects that are over $100,000, um, they must promote the use of targeted group businesses and take steps to remove <coughs> barriers to equitable participation of targeted group businesses. And then on page R65, um, on the Senate side, section 12, um, and on the House side, there are similar provisions, but, the, but there are differences um, in this relate to the um, veteran, uh, targeted group veteran owned um, targeted group um, business preferences and qualifying for those. Um, the, and this has to do with the size standard again under the Code of Federal Regulations on the Senate side. And the Senate also gives the commissioner the authority to adopt rules to uh, implement um, this program. And Mr. Chair, on the House side at the bottom of R65 is a, a provision related to the prior House provision that that if a business is going to get a veteran preference, it has to demonstrate that the owner is a, business, is a veteran. Uh, Mr. Chair, the next cluster of sections on the House side, beginning on R66 and continuing on to R74, 
all, all relate to the Office of Minute Services, the state's information technology agency. And, and I'll uh, mention uh, briefly some of the key parts here. Uh, on R66 and R67, basically the, the, these sections focus the role of Minute on the executive branch of state government, and they strike some duties that relate to uh, collaborating with other entities. Um, on R68 is just uh, renumbering uh, clauses. R69 uh, requires the Chief Information Officer of Minute to prepare a monthly progress report on projects over a million dollars. And at the bottom of page R69 uh, limits the ability of the office to enter into new agreements to provide services to political subdivisions and provides some exceptions and conditions to those limits. It, uh, R70, it clarifies that that section's effective uh, in this year, but it, it applies to new contracts and to renewals. Um, on page R71, uh, requires that state agencies enter into service level agreements with the Chief Information Officer of Minute for uh, the information, the IT services, or may obtain some of the services from an outside vendor. Uh, it requires agencies to solicit proposals from the office and from at least one outside vendor and it specifies conditions under which the uh, minute can obtain services from an outside vendor. The bottom of page R71 uh, authorizes the chief information officer to authorize an agency that's located in greater Minnesota to solicit proposals from minute and from an outside vendor separately from the rest of the agency if they have both Metro and greater Minnesota offices. On uh, page R72, there is a requirement that the chief information officer prepare an annual report on IT spending with specified information. Uh, R73 uh, relates to minute review of projects over certain size. R74 requires the chief information officer to monitor prog progress on projects with costs of more than $5 million and to report on specified uh, provisions there. Um, our, our 75 on the House side is a new topic. Uh, finishing the minute one. Uh, this provides that the total number of FTEs employed in all executive branch agencies may not exceed 35,927. And it gives the Commissioner of Management and Budget some authority to uh, be able to ensure compliance with that requirement. Page R75, at the bottom of the page, is the healthy eating here at home language that goes with the appropriation that uh, Mr. Lundin and Ms. Roberts mentioned earlier. The next cluster of materials from uh, section all the way from on R76 to R83 um, all relate to expedited and temporary licensing for members of the military. Uh, this is taken from uh, House File 506, Representative Schoen. Uh, Senate File 504, Senator Wickland, I believe. And, and, and these relate to six different licensing boards and follow up on some legislation from last year that uh, establishes procedures for expedited and temporary licensing for former and current members of the military and their spouses. And that, that goes all the way over to um, page R83, same general issue uh, in each case. And then on R83 is the Senate provision. Mr. Chair and members on R83, um, this begins a set of provisions for, from the Board of Cosmetology. Um, some of these are provisions that were initiatives of the agency itself, and then, and then three of these are um, from a bill uh, from Senator Rest to establish mobile salons. So section 13 and 14 are provisions from the Board of Cosmetology, um, the agency's initiative. And um, this um, section, and then section 15 is from Senator Rest Mobile Salon Bill. That it, right here, it just establishes a definition for mobile salon, and later we'll see a section that um, does some other things to make mobile salons um, possible. Sections 16 through um, 21 on page R84 and on to R85 are new definitions that are used elsewhere. Section 22 on page R85 is a new fee um, structure and some new fees. 
um, for the Board of Cosmetologist Examiners. On page R87, section 23 gives the board some extra time to act on a license um, application in certain circumstances, and section 24 identifies those circumstances when the when the application um, and when the applicant is the subject of a complaint investigation or the applicant has pending disciplinary actions or the application dis contains discrepancies. Sections 25 and 26 are a similar sort of thing, giving the board some extra time to act on temporary military or expedited licenses in those same sort of situations. And, um, section 27 on page R88 requires a license um, to practice as an advanced practice aesthetician, that's a term that's newly defined in, in the earlier section. Section 28 gives the Board of Cosmetology, co Cosmetologist Examiners the authority to establish rules related to the safety of practitioners and consumers right now. Their authority is only to establish rules um, to protect health. Section 29 removes a fee. This is a conforming change because the fee is put into the fee structure. Um, and that, um, then section 30, which begins on the bottom of page R88 and on to page R89, adds um, an additional continuing education course requirement for a cosmetologist license. It also prohibits marketing or the sale of products during a continuing education course, makes some other changes to the continuing education requirements. Um, and then on page R91, section 31, is a sort of a restatement of the licensing requirement to practice cosmetology for compensation. This also eliminates an exemption from the licensing requirement in current law for aestheticians that are practicing in the office of a licensed physician. On page R91, um, section 32 um, is sort of cleanup. The, there's just a clarifying change on lines 39.6 and 7, and then on, pay, on lines 39.10 through 13, it eliminates a sentence that had no verb and therefore no meaning. Um, section 33 on page R91 is the second of the mobile salons provisions. Um, this sets up in statute some requirements for mobile salons. On page R92, section 34, is a requirement that an applicant for a cosmetologist school license must employ a designated manager who has a cosmetology, cosmetology salon manager license. Section 35 on page R94 um, changes the discrimination prohibition for salon schools um, to make it conform with the Minnesota Human Rights Act. Section 36 is unrelated to the cosmetologist. This is uh, an extension of the Mississippi River Parkway Commission from 2016 to 2020 for its expiration date. On page R93, section 37 on the Senate side is the same as section 67 on the House side. Oh, not, not quite the same, almost the same, similar. Um, just it's a cleanup from the 2000, 2009 law so it provides for the appropriation to the Office of Administrative Hearings to be paid um, from a different fund than it currently is. Um, the difference in the language from the House side and the Senate side is that the Senate has specified <coughs> that the office that we're talking about is the Office of Administrative Hearings. And we did that because legislative office is just mentioned in the, in, earlier in the sentence. And so for clarity, we made that change. But otherwise, those provisions are the same. Um, um, also on page R93, section 38, um, it begins Senator Metzen's bill for the Mighty Ducks. The changes to the statute appear on page R95. It sets some <coughs> caps, or it allows for grants to be used for air quality, but then it also sets some caps for air quality grants and R22 elimination grants. <clears throat> Section 39 on page R95 is the same as the provision on the House side, Section 88. And these are, um, this is the one of a batch of sections that came from the Secretary of State's office. Section 39 on the Senate side, 41 through 45, and 58 
are all Secretary of State provisions, and they're the same on the House and the Senate side. Um, these relate to the reporting requirements and also the process of what happens when a public benefit corporation loses its, its status as a public benefit corporation. <clears throat> that takes us to page R98, section 46 on the Senate side and section 95 on the House side. Sections 46 through 56 on the Senate side um, are the same except for two items as on the House side. These are Board of Accountancy provisions. Um, I'll point out the two differences on page R99. The very first line, the Senate has an elimination of the words independent preceding the word study as part of the definition for a peer review and the House did not make that change. And then also on page R103, on the Senate side, section 56, um, the Senate increased the amount that the board was allowed to find someone for a violation of law and the House does not have that provision. And that takes us to page R107, section 57. Oh, all right. apparently I skipped something on page R96, which is not related to the accountancy board. Yes, on the Senate side, section 40, the, um, this is the first of two provisions that deal with sprinklers. Um, and this precludes um, various entities from establishing laws that require the installation of fire sprinklers. And Mr. Chair, on that same page on R96 is a provision related to the IRRRB. It strikes a provision that allows the IRRRB to use the uniform municipal contracting law instead of contracting laws that govern state agencies. It also <coughs> strikes an IRRRB exemption from one of the laws governing minute services and one of the laws governing the authority of the Commissioner of Administration. On page R107 on the Senate side, section 57 is the second of the two provisions relating to sprinklers, and this requires contractors to offer to customers the option to install sprinklers. Page R108, um, that's section 58 on the Senate side and section 105 on the House side is the last of the Secretary of State provisions. And they're the same. <coughs> And on the House side of page R108, Mr. Chair, is uh, section 107, which uh, provides uh, limits on uh, railroad condemnation powers over certain governmental property interests, uh, referencing Hennepin governmental entities in Hennepin County, and uh, referencing the, those bodies determining that public safety or access of first responders would be detrimentally affected by the exercise of the condemnation power. Page 108, 109, and 110 on the House side uh, uh, relates to the Health Insurance uh, Transparency Act, and the change is on page 110, uh, which says that notwithstanding the uh, requirements in a law governing PEEP, uh, school employees and their employers that are insured um, th through PEEP are subject to the requirements of, of this, this HIDA provision uh, relating to purchasing uh, group health insurance coverage. At the bottom of page R110 uh, and R111 on the House side, um, the House has provisions that provide for staggered terms for members of the Metropolitan Council. And then on page uh, R11, section 110, requiring that Met Council members would have to be elected city council members or mayors or county commissioners. On page R112, the nominating committee uh, for uh, Metropolitan Council appointments is changed to include specified local representatives. And at the bottom of page R112, it provides that the chair would be elected by the 16 uh, other members of the council. The uh, page R113, uh, the House provision uh, it deals with the Minnesota Sports Facilities Authority and provides that 
no members of the authority receive a salary. On page R14 on the Senate side, section 60 deals with the parking ramp for the new office building. Um, the Senate um, provides that the debt service amount be transferred from the parking fees collected and deposited in the state parking account um, be transferred to the general fund <coughs> to offset direct appropriations made to the Senate for debt service payments on the garage. Mr. Chairman, are those the debt <coughs> <coughs> no. Oh, I don't think so. <coughs> Senator. Mr. Chair, the House provision on that side requires the debt <coughs> service on that parking garage to be paid uh, by fees charged to persons parking in that garage. Section 62 on page R115 of the Senate side provides for the Commissioner of Administration to do an evaluation and report about the um, in lieu of rent payments <coughs> and then on page R R116 section 64 on the Senate side um, provides that um, this is a, a minute related thing um, for any appropriation in this bill if an agency um, makes a purchase that requires ongoing services that those ongoing services be provided by minute Mr. Chairman? Yes, Senator My Pappas. question actually was about the minute services section. Section on the bottom of page 113 and the top of 114. Those are the ones that look identical to me. I, I don't know. Mr. They Chair are. and, and uh, Senator, yes, those are those identical. Are identical. Yep. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, on page R116 on the House side, uh, section 114 specifies that the salary of the chair of the Met Council is $61,414 unless changed under the uh, normal process for uh, reviewing and changing the salaries of agency heads. Section 115, which is on the bottom of that page and the top of the next page, says that the percentage increase in salary granted to an agency head appointed by the governor can't exceed the lesser of the increase in Minnesota median household income or the consumer price index. Page R117, Section 116 creates a legislative commission on surrogacy specifying uh, legislative and other members and requires a report on specified topics back to the legislature by December 15, 2015. Um, section 1, on page 118, uh, the House and the Senate have language that appears to be identical uh, relating to um, prohibiting state funds or tax expenditures to fund a, a new Major League Soccer Stadium. Page uh, 119 on the House side limits the increases uh, in state managerial plan employees, uh, the same as I mentioned earlier for the agency heads, to the lesser of Minnesota median household income or the increase in the consumer price index. Page 119, section 119 uh, provides that executive agency spending on advertising and promotions in the upcoming biennium would not exceed 90% of the amount spent for those purposes during the current biennium. Section uh, 121 on the House side relates to stag uh, transition of staggering terms for the Met Council discussed earlier. Section 122 requires uh, minutes CIO to report to the legislature on reducing CIOs in other state agencies. Section 1, bottom of R119, the top of page R120 is a transitional uh, matter uh, relating to the members and the executive directors of the ethnic councils in a provision that was discussed earlier. And on page R21, um, well, the very bottom of R120 going on to 121 is a repealer related to the Board of Cosmetologist Examiners that repeals an unused definition. And Mr. Chair, the House repealers, uh, the, the repealers in paragraph A all relate to the public subsidy program and the state election fund. The repealers in paragraph B are uh, each separate. The repeal of 3.8886 is the Legislative Water Commission that was mentioned earlier. 
the repeal of 6.48 is the current process governing county audits. There's a new section dealing with that. 349A.07 subdivision 6 is a provision dealing with lottery procurement contracts. And 375.23 is a bill of Representative Anzelts and I believe Senator Saxhog relating to county uh, road overseers in unorganized territory. Uh, the repealers in, in paragraph D on the House side all relate to the ethnic councils that, uh, and are relate to the provision that was discussed earlier. Mr. Chair, page uh, 121, R121 on the Senate side, section one is the first of two Article three? Article three um, is the first <coughs> of two provisions relating to um, reimbursement grants that would be provided to local governments um, to reimburse them for paying the salary and benefits of public safety employees who are on authorized military leave. Section two on the Senate side, section 62 on the House side um, are um, provisions relating to the support our troops account. It expands the permitted uses um, of that account so that grants can be given to nonprofits and foundations. And those are the same on the House and Senate side. Section three on the Senate side on page R122 is an annual reporting requirement that the Adjutant General already has for the use of the Support Our Troops account. And this provision expands that reporting requirement to require the same reporting of the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs since that account is used by both, both departments. Um, section four is the second of the two provisions relating to reimbursement for authorized leave on the Senate side. On um, page R123, section five on the Senate side and section 63 on the House side um, uh, provide a death gratuity um, in the, for a service member who is um, killed as a result of duty. Um, the provisions are different in the House and the Senate side. Uh, the House or the Senate side eliminates a requirement of showing <coughs> of hardship. Um, Mr. Shepard can discuss the House side. Yep, um, Mr. Mr. Chair and members, uh, I don't have anything to add to that. We can talk about it later with the department. Okay, fine. <laughs> At the bottom of page R123, section um, six and section 64 of the House side, they're very similar, but the what um, this does is establishes a bonus program that the Adjutant General can administer to uh, provide incentives to for training in certain areas. And the Senate side makes it a requirement and the House side makes it permissive. On page R124, section seven on the Senate side and uh, section one on the House side are provisions relating to the Big Island Veterans Camp. They eliminate um, the guardianship. Well, we'll see that in the repealer later, but they also permit the Board of Trustees to remove a member on a majority vote of the trustees, and they provide for filling a trustee vacancy. The only difference is here is that the Senate side um, adds something to current language to specify that we're talking about the Big Island Veterans Camp as opposed to other veterans camps. Mr. Chair, on the House side on page R25, R125 and R126 relates to uh, veterans' preference rights up upon removal from public employment, and it allows the veteran to request th uh, the hearing to be held by a civil service panel, a merit authority, or a three-person panel defined in uh, paragraph C of this section. It also uh, provides on page R127 that the governmental subdivision would bear all the administrative costs associated with the hearing and if the veteran prevails would pay the veterans a reasonable attorney fees. Also on uh, page R127 line 73.30 to 31 on the House side strikes language that excludes teachers from veterans preference so, so they would be included under this provision. The next provision on the House side uh, is R127, the honor and remember flag. It uh, designates it as a symbol of the state's concern and commitment and uh, suggests that the chief administrator of uh, specified governmental facilities are encouraged to display the flag on 
uh, particular days listed in the bill. On page R129, section 8 on the Senate side um, authorizes the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs to establish a method of calculating a maintenance charge for domiciliary res residents, and it sets an amount for a personal needs allowance and indexes it to the consumer price index. And then um, the section, section 9, beginning at the bottom of page R129 and going on to R130, um, provides that the if a resident is behind on their payments, that that cannot be um, used to modify their personal <coughs> needs allowance. And on page R130, section 10 on the Senate side, section 2 on the House side are repealers that are identical, and, and those relate to the Big Island Veterans Camp, um, eliminating the um, Board of Guardians, I believe it's called, or the guardianship. On page R130, um, begins on the Senate side, Article 4. Uh, Article 4 is a batch of provisions relating to paramutual force raising, and the House and the Senate have identical provisions all the way through here, except for on page R133. On <coughs> line 66.18, or, or 1.9 and, and 0 0.20 on the Senate side, and 79.2 through 79.4. Um, this provision relates to uh, allowing the Racing Commission to give licenses for three years, and it's my understanding that the House provision uh, provides for those licenses to expire all at the same time, and the Senate uh, does not have that feature. Perhaps the, m the <coughs> provision within the Racing Commission um, section article um, that is most noteworthy is that the it provides for um, a clear description of calculations on the amount of um, payments that the track has to pay um, in purses. Um, there was a controversy involving the running aces track um, and the amount of <coughs> money that they were choose that they were cal that they were understanding the statute to require them to pay in purses. And so uh, the Racing Commission has addressed that with the changes in this article, and, as well as other changes. Um, uh, uh, and um, is it Miss James? Mm -hmm. uh, just if you can go over that piece a little bit for me again. So I have on R133, Section 10, there's a difference. And then can you give me what, were the, what was the other area of difference between the two? Or is it just that one piece? That's just that one. Okay, thank you. That takes us to the end of the bill. Everything else is the same. All right. Questions? Okay, well, uh, we passed this uh, gavel back and forth, and uh, so uh, it's, not, it's your plan not to meet tomorrow, right, Jerry? Okay. And we pr and and there'll be a scheduled meeting Monday, but uh, uh, that's at the call of the chair, so I'm not sure that we'll meet on Monday either. And uh, and then Tuesday would uh, be back with Chair Anderson. So uh, with that, uh, we appreciate everybody being here and. Uh, everybody's attention and uh, uh, till the next call of the chair this meeting's adjourned